Okay, so what did you what did you last hear? It's like throwing a ball. Yeah, so it's like throwing a ball. Yeah, so you don't want the ball to keep jumping. You want it to go in a smooth direction towards the minimum, towards the head. Yeah, so this is how gradient descent with momentum works. So instead of updating the weights based on right the gradient, which is the delta J of L, I update it based on this B, B J of L. What is this B J of L? It's the old value of the gradient or the old value of, uh, of, v, of B plus the current gradient, right? The, a linear combination of the current gradient and the previous right values of this vector bj. And so basically, I'm updating the weights so that I take into consideration where is the overall direction so far. Right? And that gives me some smoothness over the gradient. So it doesn't update the weight. It, does, it, it allows the weight not to fluctuate too much. Yeah, it takes a, you know, a global direction towards the middle. Okay, this is what is gradient descent with momentum. This is the one you're going to use in practice. So there's a lot of algorithms that exist for this, or a lot of optimizers exist for this, such as Adagrad, RMS prop, and Adam. So all you have to do in the library is just say, I want to use this optimizer. So you, you, you decide on what optimizer you want to use, and you typically set this beta value as a hyperparameter. Yeah, so I, I encourage you to use not use the gradient descent, but use the gradient descent with momentum. It usually works uh, better in practice. Okay. Sir, so each point when I had a line, the hammer, the the mm -hmm. uh, vibrating, is, is a, a specific point of WIJ? It's, a, it's, it's no, it's if I use the delta J directly, right? If I use the gradient alone. It will fluctuate a lot because I'm not looking at, right? I'm looking at, uh, I'm making a local decision based on the current gradient. So I'm taking one example and I'm looking at the current gradient. What is the current gradient for the slope? And it makes me fluctuate a lot. I eventually reach the minimum, but it's very slow. Yeah, because I fluctuate a lot. So one way to avoid this fluctuation is to look at previous decisions. Yeah. So it's similar to predicting the weather. Let's say I'm predicting the weather and, uh, I can predict the weather based on today alone, or I can predict it based on you know some features of, of, of uh, that tell me what the weather is today, or I can predict it based on also what did I predict the weather to be in the previous days. So that gives me some smoothness, right? If the weather was bad yesterday, it's most likely to be bad also today. Yeah, so you're taking past decisions or past past gradients into consideration as you're computing the new gradient. Understood? Yes. Okay. Finally, we're going to talk about the learning rate uh, decay. So we've talked about the learning rate as a constant. So this eta is constant. Yeah. So the step we take to update the grade, update the weights. But uh, in practice, it's not. It's it's good to also change this. Let's look at this figure. If I have a very high learning rate, so if I set eta to a very large value, it typically what happens is right as I train more and more, so as the number of epochs increase, I get the error to decrease fast, but then it increases a lot because right I, I, I end up missing. Remember this? We've looked at a figure where we have we looked at the effect of the learning rate. If it's too small, yeah. If it's too small, then it becomes slow. If it's too large, then I end up missing. Uh, the, the correct weight, the optimum weight, yeah? So if the learning rate is very high, I end up really, uh, end up with bad weights. If the learning rate is very low, so like the blue line, I end up being very slow. So I'm minimizing the error, but I'm very slow, yeah? If the learning rate is good, so like the red line, I will end up, you know, dropping the, 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 the error, and then 
getting to the minimum very fast. So I want this red line, yeah? But I don't know how to set it. I, I set it at constant, so I don't know how to set it. So one thing is to do some adaptive learning. So we do what is called uh, weight decay, a uh, rate decay. So we set the learning rate to a constant divided by one plus gamma times T, where T is the epoch, yeah? So the more epoch, the more training data I, so initially, it's set to a high value. And then as I train more and more, it becomes slower. So it becomes lower back. So I keep decreasing it, right? To kind of, uh, because I've now trained more and I got the, you know, good weights. Now we try to reduce the, the, the updates on the weights. You don't, you don't want large updates on the weights. Initially, the weights are random. So you want to update them with large values. But later on, you want to update them carefully. So that's why you kind of reduce the learning so to reduce the step with which you are updating the weight. Yeah, so of course, as T increases, this becomes a smaller track. Another way is the exponential, yeah? So basically, you're doing the same thing. And initially, you know, you have a large rate learning rate, and as you train more and more, the learning rate becomes more, yeah? Because it's e to the power, power of minus gamma T. And gamma becomes a, hyperparameter that you set based on validation data. Yeah, so this is something very common in training neural networks as well. You don't say have a fixed training learning rate, you tend to change this learning rate as you train more and more. So initially it's aggressive, it's large, and as you go, you know, you train the network and you get to better weights, you start decreasing it. You don't want the weights to, you know, you don't want to miss, you don't want to miss the minimum by increasing the weights a lot or decreasing the weights a lot. Okay, this gamma is known as the, the, the K rate. So it's a hyperparameter. And how do we get, oh, okay, by validation? By validation, exactly. exactly. So, so can't we just do also the learning rate by validation or should it change, because it changes, yeah, we can't? This is, this is the way you do it, right? So you can, the initial learning rate and, and zero or eta zero, you can also set it using validation, yeah? Oh, okay, but because it changes, so we have to do this uh, decay. Yes, yes, yes. So it's adaptive learning rate. Yeah, it's not fixed for every iteration. It starts large and then ends uh, being small as you train more and more. So as the weights get better and better, you don't want to change them too much. Okay? All right. Final thing so that you can do the assignment is hyperparameter two. So these are the hyperparameters most important hyperparameters in a neural network. Learning rate, the eta, number of layers, how many hidden layers do you have, et cetera. Number of hidden units, how many neurons per hidden layer you have. So this is the things you need to set up in your neural network. You have to train it on using a light. The many batch size, M, because you're using many batch gradient descent. The learning rate decay, so gamma. So eta is the initial learning rate, and gamma is the learning rate decay. And the momentum parameter beta if you're using gradient descent with more. So these are the different hyperparameters that we have. So this is the most important hyperparameter, the learning rate. It can really screw things up for you. So this is really one of the most important hyperparameters you uh, should set when training a neural network. There comes a number of hidden units, the many batch size, and the momentum parameter. And then finally, the number of layers, and the learning rate decay. So you can use the default values for this, or you know, start with very few layers, uh, or you know, the you, you usually don't try so many different variations of layers. Yeah, you, you you set up your mind on how many layers you should use, and you try this. Yeah, most likely it wouldn't make a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. So this is how I suggest you try to tune your hyperparameters in this order of priority. Now, in training neural networks, it's typically better to use random search rather than grid search. Do you remember grid search? You did this in the assignment, right? And, and support vector machines. Yes, you do exhaustive search using the grid search. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now we're gonna look at another me method for setting hyperparameters, which is called random search. So let's look at these two figures. I have on the left 
I have to, let's assume I have two parameters. One is an important, that's the, the yellow one or the orange one. And one is important, that's the green one. Yeah, so what does it mean important and not important? It means that by changing the yellow one, the error function doesn't change much. The loss function doesn't change much, right? While changing the green one, the error function, you know, increases or decreases more, more significantly, yeah? So ideally, I want to try more values of the green one, and I should ignore right changing the values of the orange one. It doesn't change things in the loss function. So it doesn't have an effect on the loss function. Now, if I'm using grid search, the grid search, you know, sets the, you know, looks at different values evenly. So basically, I would be trying, if I try nine different settings, I would be trying three on the orange and three on the green. Yeah. So I end up really looking at only these three red points in the loss functions. Yeah. So I end up having, you know, these three settings. So basically, what I'm saying is the problem. Right. These three do not have these three values do not have any effect on the loss function because what decides what happens to the loss function is the green one. Okay. Now with this right thing, uh, with the with the with the and the same thing here, right? So only those three values have the same effect on the loss function. Yeah. Now with random search, you try random values over the, uh, the search space that you have. And this gives you a more uh, like exposure to the loss function. So you end up really looking at nine different settings. This can give you different really, uh, 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 different effects on the loss function. So you look at this, right? This gives me this loss. This gives me this loss and so on. So really it's better to use this random search to do Hyperparameter tuning in neural networks, particularly than in, um, in, in uh, than the grid search. Yeah, it allows you to look at uh, you know a bigger space of the search space. Okay, so just a summary of what we've done so far for you to do the assignment or do any project using neural networks. You should pre-process, normalize your data. You divide your data into train and validation and maybe test, as always. Use random search to tune the different hyperparameters. Use scores to find search. So start with very few epochs and a very wide range of hyperparameters. So you know you don't have to try you know, all sorts of values for the hyperparameters. Start with a wide range and very few epochs and see what's happening. Plot the learning curve and see what is happening. Yeah, and then identify good regions of the search space and repeat the search space now focused on these good regions. Okay, so this is one example of a learning curve for, uh, for a neural network. This is the test and the uh, train. What do you see? Is the, does this have high bias or high variance? Can anybody tell me? Does it have overfitting or underfitting or what? So how do I know this? How different? Overfitting? Not overfitting, no. Lack. Underfitting. Okay. Underfitting. It's, it has oh, a so, yes, it's the loss is. Uh... They're tracking each other. Yeah, I think it's underfitting. It's underfitting, right? So it's training. The training and the the test uh, errors are tracking each other. So that's good generalization. But both of them are high. So it's almost 0.5 z. Yeah. So it's really both of them are high. So high bias. So network generalizes well, but the error is high. So what can I do? I can train a, a deeper neural network, for instance. So we always use the learning curve to guide you into the right direction of tuning the hyperparent. Finally, training a neural network is like this. It's really like a DJ setting, you know, different things up. So these are these buttons are the hyperparameters, and all you have to do is to tune them. So they're not difficult at all. They're not, com you know, complicated when it comes to implementation. It's the art is really about setting these different hyperparameters. So setting the loss function and setting the different hyperparameters to get your neural network to work good in practice. Yeah, so really, it's all about this. That ends the lecture. So I will post the assignment on Sunday. And once you practice using the assignment, this will be a crystal clear in your OK? Uh, sir? Yes. I have a question before the session. And 
So in the assignment, uh, when I use the usual solver, it gives as it doesn't converge. So I change it to Saga. Is this uh, uh, okay or not? For which question? The first question? The second question, the learning. Yeah. Logistic regression. Yeah, if you used what and it didn't convert? Uh, LBFG, I don't remember the name. I changed it. Hey, the, the default, so I changed it into Saga. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, and the tolerance, should we change it or keep it as default? You can keep it as default, it's fine. 